Hi, I am in Athens, Greece. My name is Milana Weintrub. I am an actress and comedian living in Los Angeles, and I am a refugee. In the United States, the Soviet Union is finally allowing thousands of Jews to emigrate and leave their lives of religious persecution. But now the United States is blocking their flight to freedom. Leaving virtually everything behind, they came here to wait for an interview with the Immigration and Naturalization Service. For the Weintraub family, help cannot come too soon. So for now, all the Weintraubs have is this videotape. <laughs> I came to Greece to vacation with my dad and very quickly I realized how ridiculous that is. It's just an insane time to be on vacation here because the country is experiencing not only a huge financial turmoil but also a giant influx of refugees that they can't support. So people are fleeing because there's a civil war in Syria to dominate the region. It's trapping its citizens in the crossfire between the government, rebels, and extremist groups, all of whom have committed serious war crimes, including use of toxic chemical weapons, torture, and mass attacks on civilians. According to the UN, the death toll is over 250,000 and 12 million people have been displaced. Over 4 million people have fled Syria and thousands continue to make the trek through Turkey where they pay about $1,500 to smugglers who put the refugees in small rafts to make the dangerous six mile trip across the Aegean Sea to the Greek island of Lesbos every day. I was supposed to fly home like four hours ago and I'm not gonna do that. I'm getting on a plane to fly to the island of Lesbos, which is really in need of resources and volunteers, all sorts of shit. I mean, I don't really know what I'm gonna do, but I can't do nothing. I don't wanna be a passive citizen anymore. I wanna be a force for good. The next day, I flew out to Lesbos with my new friend, Eamon, who I met a couple days prior at a refugee volunteer meeting in Athens. You decided to join me on this trip pretty last minute. Yes, yeah. Uh, at like 2 a.m. you booked your ticket. Yeah. And the next day we got on a plane. Yes. What, yeah, I, what changed your mind last minute? <laughs> Can I say alcohol? Yeah, alcohol. <laughs> We're making our way down this mountain right now and it's actually amongst like a, a beautiful resort land, except for there are life jackets sprinkled on the streets. After reaching out to everybody I could on social media and a few email introductions, I finally got hooked up with Christos, who's a nurse on the island. Hi, are you Christos? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about the situation here in the Yeah, I think it will be so. Actually, the situation in uh, Mytilini get worse from February 2015. Migrant flows starting to climb maxing every day. And uh, now we are up to 2,000 people per day, 3,000 people per day sometimes. The two hotspots of the island, of the boats arriving, is the airport and at uh, Molibos, it's uh, the nearest point of uh, the coastal line of Turkey. The NGOs hire buses. The bus coming every one hour, they pick up all the people arriving and they bring them to the camps. And there are two registration camps, one for the Syrian people and one for uh, all the other ethnicities. Uh, when they arrive at the camp, uh, they give their personal details and they take their, uh, their release paper. Now every day many people are coming and this uh, little island cannot hold people in the downtown area because the boats are capacity full every day. And that's why many people stay in tents, so they wait the next morning uh, the ship, but this is all circulating. Many people arriving, not so many people going. So it was the port police's uh, call to make the procedure more simplified, so the people can leave sooner from here for the journey to Central Europe. Christos gave us a point on the GPS to drive to. He said, we'll see a road and know where to go from there. So we uh, drove up to this viewpoint to watch boats come in because there really isn't an organized place or a way to predict where the boats are coming in. Someone drove by with binoculars and uh, with that we were able to spot a tiny little orange dot. We're gonna try to rush down and get these people up. There's lots of doctors here to reach people but they are still in need of emergency blankets and 
uh, people who can speak the language. Luckily, Eamon speaks Arabic and, and he's helping out. I'm kind of just wrapping babies in blankets. But there's lots of kids and lots of men and lots of emotions. Now, the refugees begin their two-hour hike to a bus stop that would take them to the registration camps. Some organizations and independent volunteers would give rides to those in need. We picked up this handicapped man and a family for... Is that what they're from? No, I'm American. Where are you from? From Syria. Syria. From Aleppo, city. Big city, north of Syria. Aleppo, uh -huh. yes. Uh, my town is Maria. Maria. Now, every building in the town is destroyed. Very important town. Uh -huh. Maria is very important. For, for, for Syrian revolution. Uh -huh. Start. In Aleppo, from yeah. Maria. No one person uh, mm. was in Maria today. Assad regime, pump, every day, every day. And Assis, Assis? ISIS, yeah. ISIS, no? you? Daesh. Criminal, Criminal. bomb for 15, 15 days. Non stop. Every day, every day, maybe 30 bomb. Do you know where you want to go now? Maybe that... I will go to. I will to. Uh, I want to complete my study. I was study in ma on master uh, international law. Uh -huh. International law. Uh -huh. <laughs> what did he say? He thinks uh, it's a swimming pool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he sees a swimming pool. Almost. Behind me is a station that's set up to get dry clothes and food and emergency blankets. There's medical attention, people from uh, Denmark, Holland, uh, and then obviously the refugees. They're giving all of the children new socks and shoes and pants, some of them underwear because they've been totally drenched. They were just at sea for hours, but uh, the spirits are good here and, I, and people are optimistic. In the meantime, we see another boat coming in, so we're gonna go back up the hill and see if we can help up there. Shabab. We drove the family down to the base where they would wait for the bus to take them to the refugee registration camp. There, we saw Ollie, a young refugee, have an epileptic seizure. We took him to the local hospital so that Eamon could translate Ollie's condition to the doctors. We're now at a tiny hospital in a town called Colonis, which is about 30 minutes from where we had a base. Although we had doctors there, we had to make sure that he was okay. We also learned that he hadn't taken his medication in a month because he couldn't take it with him. He had nothing on him besides money and a passport and his phone. Hopefully we'll be able to get him medication and they're gonna treat him for free. Uh, we got Ollie medicine and have now dropped him off at the camp called Karatepe, which is um, where all of you want to say hi. Hi! <laughs> this is where a lot of the refugees are staying. It's tents, chain link fences, porta potties, and uh, people scrambling to get paperwork. Lots of kids and trash and people sitting on the floor and waiting. There is kind of an abandoned sad playground here too. There's a bus behind me letting in even more people and um, there's probably, I don't know, I'm terrible at this, maybe 500 people in there. None of them want to stay here. The ones that have money have gotten hotels and they're sipping coffee by the beach. These aren't those people. These are people with kids that are sleeping on their laps while they're sitting on a curb. Supposedly there's eight boats coming in this morning. We could see two 
maybe three of them, but uh, the Coast Guard is stopping them right now, which must be extremely terrifying for them. There's also a helicopter above them. But we hear the, the Coast Guard is most active early in the morning. I don't know if that message has gotten across to Turkey, because if they knew, then they, maybe they wouldn't leave so early. This man reached Lesbos before the rest of his family and he wanted to wait on the beach until they arrived. After two days of waiting, he learned his family was too scared to cross the sea and they had returned to Syria, a place he was now unable to re-enter. We were told last night there were two boats that left and uh, one of them had an accident. There were two children and one woman that washed up on shore this morning and uh, and the other bodies haven't been found yet. I've been dressing wet babies for like five hours. We've completely run out of clothes for men and most adults. As limited as these resources are, this is probably the most hospitality people will see in a while. If anything, it, it, it might even give them a, a false sense of what's ahead because we're giving them food and welcoming them and giving them hugs and clothes. And then they go off to places like Karatepe where there is nothing. <laughs> The next day, Eamon left and I was carless. Going to the beach wasn't an option because it's over an hour away, but the refugee camps were only a short cab ride from my hotel. Supporting the local economy. Okay, I got some tomatoes and bread and cheese and oranges, bananas, cookies. That should be enough to make a dent. So this camp is actually at a detention center. People are really thirsty and confused and they're not getting really any communication about how to apply for asylum or where to get tickets. Give me apple. Apple? No, I have a banana. Do you want a banana? Orange. I have an orange, yeah. You know, I think the hardest part of this is knowing how much longer their journey is going to be after they land and seeing them so happy and grateful for their lives and then giving them a little bit of consoling before their very long journey and because i came from athens where a lot of them are trying to get to and i know what that looks like which is lots of tents on the street and more sleeping outside and more difficulty getting paperwork or getting accepted to another country that has maybe opened its doors or closed its doors now and that's the hardest part is seeing how much further they have to go. Now that I'm back, I'm starting an organization called Can't Do Nothing at can'tdonothing.org and it's a place for you to find out simple ways that you can help these displaced people and I think there's lots of easy things that we can all do to make the world a better place. And uh, first thing you could do is share this video and inform people about what's happening. You could also visit can'tdonothing.org to find easy ways that you could share your time, your money, your voice to make a huge impact in the world. Can'tdonothing.org. I really believe that together we could help a lot of people.